Welcome to lecture three for the historical books, Bright Old Testament 510, as we continue our study of the book of Judges. Today we'll be looking at the judges themselves, focusing on chapters 3 through 16, and looking at the 11 judges, plus Barak and Deborah, as they're listed here for us in the book of Judges. So without further ado, let's dive in. There are 11 judges in the book of Judges that we're going to take a look at. Six of them are considered minor judges, Shamgar, Tola, Jer, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, so-called minor because of the amount of information that's given to them, which is minor. The other five judges are considered major judges because more information is given about them, including their patronage, their tribe, what it is that they accomplished, etc. We've not included on this list Deborah or Barak or Abimelech. Abimelech is actually called a king and Barak and Deborah are not really judges per se, although we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail in a few moments. We're going to begin by looking at the minor judges, and then we'll progress to looking at the major judges. First, I need to make a few comments about Othniel. Why do we consider Othniel a major judge? Why not a minor judge? There's really not that much information given about him. In fact, there seems to be more information given about his wife than given about Othniel. Othniel goes out and makes war. He saves the people. He acts as a judge for a certain number of years. But beyond the fact that he is uh, related to Caleb as his nephew, we're not really given that much information. Othniel just doesn't seem all that important. Therefore, we can call Othniel a minor judge because the information given is minor. However, a lot of scholars consider Othniel a major judge because he is prototypical of what judges will be like. He is the standard by which all other judges are, well, judged. If you remember, we have a pattern, a macro pattern of judges in the book of Judges, how each judge is going to be discussed and talked about and the pieces of information that will typically be given. And all of these are based upon the story of Othniel. Othniel is considered a major judge because his account becomes prototypical for all the later accounts of the judges. We can compare the other accounts of the Judges to the account of Othniel to see what the author of Judges has left out or potentially changed when describing those other Judges. There are several steps, and remember, all of them are included in the story of Othniel. Israel does evil. They forget their God. God's anger burns against them. God sells them or hands them over to an enemy. They become subject to that enemy for a certain number of years. God raises up a judge. The Spirit of God comes upon that judge. So that person becomes a judge and goes to war. The Lord gives the enemy into the hands of the judge. The land has peace, at least until that judge dies. This is the prototype for judge accounts in the book of Judges, the standard by which all other judge accounts can be judged. Thus, Othniel's story, while including only four verses in chapter 3 and a few verses in chapter 2, becomes a major story because of its prototypical nature, the account being the standard by which all other accounts can be compared. We have no option but to call the other six minor judges minor judges because with Othniel we have a lot of information compacted into a few verses. With the other six minor judges we have very little information compacted into very few verses. For instance, in the case of Shamgar, we only have three verses one of which is actually narrative, where we're told that he's the son of Anath, that he kills 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad and saves Israel. Poetically, Deborah mentions him in chapter 5 after she and Barak have delivered Israel in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, again referencing perhaps that this is taking place simultaneously in chapter 5 with the events of chapter 3. And yet either way, we see that Shamgar does a lot, killing 600 men, but we're not even told how long he is judge. Perhaps he's judge for a short period of time, although given the outline of the book of Judges, my guess is that he's a judge for a long period of time, since the length of the judges seems to get smaller within the minor judges as we move on. Some people have suggested that Shamgar is not actually an Israelite, because his name is built off of four letters, Shin, Mem, Gimel, Resh, rather than the typical three letters, However, there are a number of participles in other languages that start with an SH, and so it's possible that this is a participle from Mem Gimel Resh, 
and that he is Shamgar, he is the one who is doing whatever Magar is. A lot of different options here, but the theories continue as to whether or not Shamgar was raised up from outside Israel, which would be very odd. More than likely, he is an Israelite, he just has a very unique name. After Shamgar, we have a major judge, Gideon, and after Gideon, we have another minor judge, Tola. In between Gideon and Tola, though, we have Gideon's son. Gideon's son is never referred to as a judge. In fact, he's called the ruler or the king in some English translations. He rules over Shechem. Uh, he, after the death of Gideon, goes through and kills all of his brothers, except for one, Jotham. Jotham curses the uh, followers of Abimelech, the men of Shechem, and says that fire is going to come out and consume them, which ironically is exactly what happens, as Abimelech will eventually burn down the tower that the men of Shechem and their women and children are hiding in, killing all of them. Abimelech tries to do the same at the next town that he goes and invades, but they're smarter and drop a millstone on his head, which kills him. He actually is only half dead, and has his armor bearer run him through, since a woman threw the millstone, Abimelech doesn't want it to be said that a woman killed him. So he commits suicide on the spot, and passes, to no one's regret, into history. However, after Abimelech, there arises a man named Tola. Tola, the son of Pua. Both Toa and Pua are common names in Issachar. Tola and Pua were both the names of sons of Issachar. Tola, though, is not the son of that Pua, the son of Issachar. Instead, this is Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, that piece of information being given to us again to remind us that these are not the direct descendants of Issachar in one generation, but at least a couple generations removed. He lives at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim, which is odd, and begins to raise a few questions in our mind. Why is a man of Issachar in Ephraim? He judges Israel for 23 years, though, which is quite a significant amount of time. And yet, when he dies and is buried, he's buried again at Shamir in Ephraim. Which raises the question that even though he arose to save Israel, in verse 1, was he a judge of Issachar, or he was a judge of Ephraim? The text doesn't really say, nor does it specify. Nor, to some degree, does the text care. The emphasis seems to be more upon the 23 years, that at least in the mind of the writer of Judges, 23 years is a significant amount of time to be listed here. And as we'll see in just a moment, especially with the last three minor judges, 23 years compared to those three years highlights that not just the major judges went downhill, but the minor judges. This seems to be part of why the writer of Judges bothers to include this particular reference at all. Who cares about Tola if he didn't really do anything? Perhaps the people in Israel were familiar with Tola. Perhaps he's emphasizing Issachar, showing that the judges came from numerous tribes. Or perhaps he's emphasizing the downhill trajectory of the book of Judges, that you have Shamgar doing something amazing and killing 600 of the Philistines, and you have Tola and the judge after him, Jer, judging for 23 years and 20-some-odd years for Jer, and yet after Jephthah, the minor judges go significantly downhill, not judging for more than a few years each. So Tola is still part of the overall theme of the book of Judges, that downward trajectory, as the writer of Judges continues to emphasize that things were going from bad to worse in Israel. Even though they may have started well with Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and gotten really crazy with Gideon, after Tola and Jer, it's a speedy trip downhill. After Tola, we have Jer the Gileadite. Gilead is in Manasseh, northeast of Israel, uh, across the Jordan River. He judges Israel for 22 years, not quite as long as the 23 years that Tola judged, and yet we're told that he has 30 sons who ride on 30 donkeys in 30 cities in the land of Gilead. This may seem like a random piece of information, but we need to keep these numbers in mind. He reigns 22 years as a judge, or rules, perhaps reigns is not quite the right word, but he serves as a judge for 22 years, and he has 30 sons on 30 donkeys. After he dies, they bury him, and we move on to Jephthah. Jephthah is in some ways the turning point in Israel. At least Ehud and Gideon were decent human beings, Gideon certainly failing as we get near the end of his lifetime, although he started out with questionable faith. 
Jephthah seems to start with great faith and yet ends in a very odd way, which we'll look at when we get to Jephthah's story, massacring the Ephraimites and actually sacrificing his own daughter as a burnt offering. After him, the minor judges begin to go downhill. We have Ibzan of Bethlehem, which means he's either from the tribe of Benjamin or from the tribe of Judah, either one, since Benjamin is right on the border between the two tribes. It wouldn't surprise us to find out that he's from Judah and that the writer of Judges has simply left out that piece of information, since he tends to think very positively of the men of Judah, perhaps being from the tribe of Judah himself. Although Jer was not specified as to which tribe he came from either, instead we're told Gilead, which we all know is in Manasseh. Here we know that Bethlehem is either in Benjamin or in Judah, or both. He has 30 sons, just like we saw of Jer, although he also has 30 daughters. But now we have a problem. He gives the 30 daughters in marriage outside the clan, which was not supposed to be done. And 30 daughters he brings in from outside for his sons. This is not good. Now we begin to wonder what's going on. Why do we have judges that aren't doing the right thing, not following after God? It was one thing back with Gideon, where Gideon made an ephod, presumably to communicate with God, and yet that ephod was used as an idolatrous instrument by his descendants. We also have the craziness with Abimelech. Jephthah himself was questionable, seeing as he didn't know the law enough to know that he could spare his own daughter, and seeing as he got mad and massacred the Ephraimites. But now we have a judge who's flat out giving his people outside the clan. They're supposed to keep the land in the clan, and the land goes with the people, goes with the sons and the daughters in some cases. So we have some questions being raised here, some red flags as it were. And those are further confirmed by the fact that he only judges for seven years. Now the time frame is getting a little shorter. No longer 23 years or 22 years. Now we have only seven years, after which point he dies and is buried. After Ibzan, we return again to being told what tribe each person is from. Elon is said to be a Zebulonite. He is from Zebulun. We're told that he only judges Israel for 10 years, again a little bit longer than Ibzan, who only judged for 7 years, and yet we're not given much more information than that. So again, a significantly shorter period of time than the 23 years of Tola or the 22 years of Jer. Even more significant is the fact that he's buried at Aijalon, which according to chapter 1 verse 35 was owned by the Amorites. So we have some questions here, some nagging details that are missing. Again, the writer of Judges seems to be suggesting that these latter minor judges have gone downhill, just as the major judges have gone downhill with Jephthah and with Samson. So we're left wondering what exactly is going on in Israel at this time. With Abdon, we hit rock bottom when it comes to the minor judges. We're told that he's the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, which means very little to us until we come to verse 15 and find out that Pirithon is in the land of Ephraim. We're told that he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons riding on 70 donkeys, as though to say, see, he's got much more than Jer had and his 30 sons. And yet at the same time, we're told that Abdon only judges Israel for eight years. We begin to wonder why the judges have become so short in their reign as judge. We had Tola as 23 years, Jer as 22 years, and yet then we have Ibzan as seven Elon as 10, and now Abdon as 8. This is very odd. We seem to have gone up in terms of the amount of sons and the amount of grandsons. Fantastic! And yet less than the amount of reign that they actually serve as judge. Not to mention the fact that in verse 15 we're told that Abdon is buried in the hill country of the Amalekites. How good of a judge can Abdon really be if he's buried in a land in Ephraim, that is still part of the hill country of the Amalekites. It was bad enough in the previous judge, Elon, that we had a reference to Aijalon, which according to chapter 1 was in the hands of the Amorites, although presumably it's no longer in the hand of the Amorites. But now we're being told that Abdon is being buried in the land of the Amalekites. Not saying that presumably it used to be. No, it still is. It still is in the hands of the Amalekites. 
So we have Abdon living among the Amalekites, being buried among the Amalekites, just as we'll have Samson living among the Philistines. We have gone substantially downhill. The length of time for each judge has gotten substantially shorter. The amount of work accomplished by the judge has become substantially less. We have serious problems in Israel. They're only going to get worse when we look at Samson. Now we turn our attention to the major judges in the book of Judges. Again, keeping in mind that we consider Othniel a major judge because of the fact that he is prototypical for all the other judges, minor in the sense of the amount of information that's given to him, but he is really the high point, the beginning of the system of judges that continues to go downhill all the way to Samson. So let's look at each of the judges in turn, beginning with Ehud. After Othniel, we have Ehud who arises as judge, a left-handed Benjaminite. This is significant for a number of different reasons. Some people have suggested that it's significant because he could keep his sword on his right-hand thigh and then pull out the sword with his left hand and unsuspectingly kill the king. However, there's nothing in the text that suggests that it's the fact that he has his sword on his right thigh that allows him to be able to kill the king or to carry the sword into the king's presence, although that's often the Sunday school explanation. What's more important is the fact that he's a left-handed Benjaminite. We will see left-handed Benjaminites at the end of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 20, when we read about 700 chosen men of Benjamin who are all left-handed and who can sling a stone with a sling at a hair and not miss, according to chapter 20, verse 16. So this is, again, the book ending of the book of Judges, where we started with Judah in Othniel and a great judge going all the way downhill to Samson, and here starting with a Benjaminite who's left-handed, and we will go all the way down to a left-handed Benjaminite in chapter 20 as Israel is attempting to devote to destruction the tribe of Benjamin. We've gone from devoting to destruction the Moabites to devoting to destruction God's people, the Israelites. So this is a significant decline in Israel from this high point down to that low point. Ehud will come and will fight against Eglon. He will kill him in the upper chamber by telling him that he's a secret message for him and then stabbing him. Famously, the sword goes into his belly and the fat closes over it. And it's said that the dung comes out. This is also probably a reference to the fact that the Servants of Eglon seem to think that he's relieving himself, not in the sense of taking a nap. More than likely, they think he's on the throne. And by on the throne, I don't mean a golden throne. I mean the porcelain throne, although it's probably not porcelain in those days. But they seem to think that he's using the restroom, that he's using the bathroom, and they don't want to interrupt because that would just be impolite. What they don't know is that he's dead, and by the time they figure it out, Ehud is long gone. He goes and he summons the men of the hill country of Ephraim. Odd, because he's a Benjaminite, you would think that he would call out the men of Benjamin, and yet calling out the men of the hill country of Ephraim is fairly common. It appears that the men of the hill country of Ephraim were mighty warriors. The hill country of Ephraim will play a significant part of the book of Judges. Deborah is from the hill country of Ephraim, as are several other of the judges. Gideon seems to be hiding in the hill country of Ephraim uh, in Judges chapter 6. We see the men of the hill country of Ephraim called out after Gideon and after Jephthah to fight. And we see some disagreement between Gideon and Jephthah and the men of the hill country of Ephraim because of the scenario of what takes place when they are called out to fight. This will again be repeated again and again that the men of the hill country of Ephraim are what are called out to fight, presumably because they're mighty warriors and also because, as Jacob foretold in Genesis 48 and 49, the people of Ephraim would be mighty so that by the time we get to the prophets, it is common to refer to the entire northern kingdom as Ephraim. Ephraim then became somewhat of an uh, all-inclusive term for the people of northern Israel, and so it's possible that even here, when we read the hill country of Ephraim, he doesn't just mean the Ephraimites, but anybody who lives in the upper highlands area northeast of Jerusalem. In other words, all the warriors that live on the eastern part of Israel— they're called out to fight against the eastern neighbor, the southeastern neighbor in this case, the Moabites, and the northeastern neighbor, the Amalekites. They come out and they make war and they destroy 10,000 men of the Moabites. 
This is a significant accomplishment, and the land has rest for 80 years as they continue to follow after Ehud and his judging, and as they continue to follow God at least for a time. And yet we know that things are going to continue to go downhill again and again and again until we end up with the other left-handed Benjaminites at the end of the book of Judges. After Ehud, we have Shamgar, and after Shamgar, we have Gideon, and yet in between Shamgar and Gideon, we have Barak, and we have Deborah. What do we do with Barak and Deborah? The next judge, if we want to use that term, is Barak. Barak is fairly interesting in that he's never really called a judge. There's one passage in 1 Samuel that refers to Barak as a judge. However, that appears to be a textual variant, and it seems to be that Abdon is the judge that's being mentioned in 1 Samuel, and not Barak. We're also told that the one who is doing the judging, at least in the particular circumstance that we find her in, is Deborah. However, as we will discuss in class, Deborah is not presented as a judge. She's never referred to as a judge, and while she's judging, she is judging at that time. However, in the book of Judges, at that time almost always refers to a punctiliar sense of time, not an ongoing as in she in that general time frame was being a judge, but at that particular moment she was giving a judgment in response to the particular threat that exists there in Israel at the time. Deborah really seems to be a mark upon Barak, the fact that Barak is chicken and won't go to battle without her. She raises up Barak and sends him out to fight, but she does so by saying, has the Lord not commanded you? As if to say, you've already been told to do this and you're ignoring him. In the end, Barak will receive no glory from his destruction of the enemies of God. Instead, Jael will be the one who will drive the pent stag through the head of Sisera. You may remember that Jael is a Kenite. We had the Kenites seemingly randomly mentioned back in chapter 1, now we begin to understand why. We needed to know who the Kenites were so that when we came to Jael, we'd understand why she was a non-Jew in the technical sense, a non-Israelite, and yet was still living in the region. It also explains why the Kenites had a relationship with Sisera and with the enemies of God in that particular circumstance. Really, this whole story seems to be a mark on the book of Judges as a whole and not just on Barak. For instance, when we look at the list, we see that there are 12 judges, but we're missing one if we take out Barak, and then we're left with 11. I personally think that the author of the book of Judges does this on purpose, that he knows that you expect 12, because we have 12 tribes, and yet he pulls one out to emphasize how crazy and messed up the book of Judges is, and how crazy and messed up Barak is, that he was supposed to be the 12th judge, but he doesn't do it. Instead, the prophetess has to come along and has to serve as the one giving the judgment. The land does have peace after the events of Barak and Deborah's actions against the enemies of God, but for whatever reason, uh, we don't really consider them judges, although we'll discuss this further in class as to whether or not we should. Again, as has already been mentioned in class, it's difficult to know. Did the author assume that you would recognize Barak as the twelfth judge? Or did he assume that you would recognize him as the 12th judge, so he deliberately left him out, so that you would see that there are only 11? Another interesting fact that takes place in this particular story is the fact that Barak and the events of Deborah seem to take place during the reign of Shamgar as a judge. Because when Deborah sings her song in Judges chapter 5, she refers to it taking place in the days of Shamgar, as though there is some overlap. This is the only time that we see an explicit reference to an overlap in the book of Judges. We also have Deborah's song, which is considered by even secular scholars as one of the oldest discussions of a theophany of God as he comes to the rescue of Israel in the first part of her poem. She's really recapturing all of the events that take place in chapter 4, but then she is putting them into poetry and poetic rhyme as it were, in order to carry across the emotion that took place uh, during these particular events. So these particular uh, events that take place in these two chapters are significant within the trajectory of Israel, as by the time we get to Samson, we have women not being like Deborah, but being like Delilah, still part of that downhill trajectory. But already we begin to see, see that there's problems. Ehud has done what he was supposed to do. Othniel has done what he was supposed to do. But now we have questions about Barak, questions that will only worsen when we get to Gideon. 
After Barak, we have Gideon. Gideon is most famous for whittling down his men based on their drinking style and then going and defeating the Midianites with torches and pitchers. The Lord throws them all into confusion, so the Midianites end up killing each other. This is a very significant story, one that's referenced again in the book of Isaiah. It's a very important part of Israel's history as they defeat the Midianites here. It's also famous because of the fact that Gideon lays out a fleece prior to actually going and attacking, which is not a good thing. Oftentimes Christians will say, I'm laying out a fleece. What that basically means is, I do not believe the direct revelation of God, because Gideon has the direct revelation of God from the angel of the Lord, who he knows to be the angel of God, who he knows to be God himself. And yet he doesn't listen when the angel tells him what he's supposed to do. He also doesn't listen each time that he lays out the fleece. Eventually, it will take him hearing the dream between two Midianite soldiers before he actually trusts that God is going to give him success. In the end, he does have success, and he goes out and pursues the Midianites. He also calls out the men of the hill country of the Ephraimites to come and attack. The Ephraimites actually get a little upset at Gideon here, which is a significant part of the story, as we'll see later, because Gideon is able to smooth things over with the Ephraimites so that it doesn't lead to bloodshed. He does have problems with the town of Succoth, and eventually has to come back and teach them a lesson by beating them all with briars, but he doesn't kill any of the Israelites. He only kills the Midianites, kills their two kings, and then eventually uh, takes over as judge for a long period of time. He's asked to be king, and he says, I will not be king, and yet he names his son Evimelech, which means my father is king, which makes it questionable whether or not uh, Gideon really wanted to be king. He was, in some ways, acting like a king, and his son, Avimelech, certainly acts like a king. Avimelech takes over as the heir apparent, as it were, of Gideon because he kills all of his brothers, so he's the only one left, except for Jotham. Jotham curses uh, Avimelech and says that fire is going to come out from Avimelech and consume whoever aligns with him, and that Avimelech himself is going to be destroyed. And that's certainly what happens. Avimelech burns down the town of Shechem, which is actually the town that he's from. He burns down that town, killing all the elders. And when he tries to do it in the next town, it doesn't work. Instead, somebody throws a millstone at him and crushes his head, killing him. So in the end, Avimelech passes away to no one's regret. Unfortunately, that is not Gideon's only legacy. He also makes an ephod and gives it to his family. And for whatever reason, he thinks that that's a good idea, and they begin to worship it and to serve it and not to pay attention to God. Instead, they worship this particular uh, ephod in the town of Orphra, uh, which is Gideon's hometown. And it, we're told in the text that it becomes a snare to Gideon and his family. So presumably Gideon himself uh, was worshiping or worshiping with it. Uh, so... Not a very good legacy for Gideon here. The land has peace for 40 years, and yet in the end we find that the people go right back because Gideon has not led them away from the false worship that they were doing, even engaging it in himself and also engaging in the actions of a king, having a bunch of concubines, uh, which are typically found with allegiances between kings of one land and kings of another. So Gideon is acting like a king. He's leading Israel's worship like a king, obviously in the wrong direction, but he's claiming not to be a king. All in all, while Gideon has a great victory, the legacy that he leaves behind is not great. In fact, it just continues that downward trajectory in Israel, especially when we get to the craziness of Abimelech, or Avimelech, and then beyond. After Gideon and two minor judges, we have Jephthah. Jephthah is interesting in that he is not raised up by God as judge. Instead, the Israelites come and raise him up as judge. The Gileadites themselves, Gilead being a major town in Manasseh, which again was the tribe of Gideon, is also here the tribe of Jephthah. Jephthah's mom was a prostitute, and the men of, uh, of Gilead come and find him and say, you need to come back and rescue us from the Ammonites. It's also interesting in that chapter 11 immediately follows after chapter 10 in most Bibles. And in chapter 10, we read of the great repentance of Israel after God says that he's no longer going to help them. They weep, they offer sacrifices, they get rid of their false gods. And so God says that he's going to deliver them. 
and yet the immediate action that takes place afterwards is not Israel crying out to God to deliver them. Instead, as the Ammonites are coming and attacking, the Israelites assemble and decide that they're going to go find a judge. And so they go and find Jephthah the Gileadite, who is a mighty warrior. Israel is repentant, at least in chapter 10, but doesn't seem to have actually put their faith in God to deliver them. They're still orchestrating events here, trying to get things worked out on their own. Jephthah and the king of the Ammonites debate back and forth. Eventually, uh, Jephthah will attack uh, the Ammonites. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and he crosses uh, over Gilead and Manasseh, goes through Mizpah, which is where the Israelites had assembled in chapter 10, and fights against the Ammonites. Unfortunately, Jephthah makes a rash vow here and says whatever comes out of the door of his house, when he returns, he will give it to the Lord as a burnt offering. And that's exactly what we see take place. His daughter is the first one out, and in my opinion, he does offer her up as a burnt offering. After she has mourned for the fact that she will never marry, after she mourns her virginity, I believe that he really does offer her up as a burnt offering. Jephthah is not aware of the law, not aware that there is a way to redeem people from a vow so that he could have redeemed her. He doesn't know the law. Apparently, the priests have not been teaching the law. Nobody seems to understand the law in Israel in these days. So that's one mark against Jephthah. The other mark against Jephthah is the fact that he attacks the Ephraimites. We remember back in the story of Gideon that the Ephraimites were called out and that they came out and got mad at Gideon for not calling them out sooner. Well, the same happens here in chapter 12. Jephthah calls out the Ephraimites, and the Ephraimites get mad again. Why didn't you call us out? Why did you go without us? Jephthah, instead of smoothing things over like Gideon, seizes the fords of Jordan and decides to kill everybody from the Ephraimites who can't say the word shibboleth correct. Instead, they say the word Sibboleth with an S instead of an S-H. And in the end, Jephthah and his followers end up killing 42,000 Ephraimites. Now, just to put this into perspective, that is more men than all of the judges killed of the enemies of God put together. Jephthah has killed more Israelites than enemies of God die in the entire book of Judges which again shows that we have sunk pretty low in Israel. He doesn't know the law. He sacrificed his own daughter. He's making rash vows. He was not raised up by God as a judge. He seems to have been raised up by the men of Gilead themselves. And now he is killing 40 plus thousand men of Israel, more than even the Ammonites that he killed. We have sunk pretty low with Jephthah. And at this point, we might be thinking that we can't go any lower. But just wait. Next, we have Samson. Samson's story begins oddly. There's a vision that takes place as the angel of God appears to both Samson's mom and Samson's dad. They see the angel of the Lord go up in the flames of the altar and the sacrifice that they have made to God. They know that this is God, the God of Israel, that they've seen Yahweh. They're afraid they're going to die, and yet they name Samson after a foreign god. Samson's name is really based on the three-letter root Shemesh, Shemesh being the Hebrew word for sun, but also the word for sun, the god of the sun in the Canaanite religion. We have O-N at the end of Samson's name, which is often called a diminutive. It's very much like the letter Y in English, where we have Jim and Jimmy. So here we have sun and, well, literally sunny. So here we've gone a step further than Gideon's lack of faith, Gideon saw God, knew that it was God, and didn't believe what he said. Here we have Samson's parents apparently not only ignoring what the angel said, since they never enforced the whole idea of Samson being a Nazarite vow, where they go and they take a Philistine woman to be Samson's wife, but we also have them naming their son after a foreign god. We have continued to sink low. Samson is said to have judged Israel for 20 years, which really complicates things in terms of what a judge is, since we don't see Samson doing anything good for Israel over those 20 years other than killing Philistines every once in a while when he loses his temper. In the end, Samson is a very tragic figure. He dies at the hands of the Philistines, actually by his own hands as he knocks the temple over that they're all gathered in. He ends up having problems with women repeatedly, 
each time he escapes, and yet in the end he is captured, his eyes are put out, and his hair is cut because of Delilah. So rather than having Barak being helped by his wife or his prophetess Deborah, rather than having Othniel being helped by his wife, we have Samson who's being led astray by women. So we have really gone downhill in Israel. We have judges who are no longer striking at the enemy. Instead, we have judges who are literally marrying and sleeping with the enemy. As he has concubines from Philistia in Gath, as he takes two wives from the Philistines. We see the tension that exists between Samson and God throughout his whole lifetime. And yet, Samson is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, alongside Gideon. So even though we've sunk low, and even though at first glance we might think that Samson's not even a believer, we recognize that God indeed used Samson, used him mightily in order to deliver Israel, so that he was said to have served as a judge for 20 years in Israel, whatever that might mean. He accomplished great things by setting them free, not completely destroying them, as we'll continue to have problems with Philistines in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, But at least we begin the initial defeat of the Philistines here under Samson. Samson reminds us that God can use anyone, even somebody as messed up as Samson. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 3. A little bit shorter of a lecture today than we will often have in this class. I encourage you, if you have not done so, to read through the book of Judges as part of your required reading, but also for our discussion on this coming Thursday. Looking forward to a great discussion as we talk about whether or not Barak and Deborah should be considered judges, and as we look at the events of the particular judges as they go downhill. One thing that we'll often have to keep in mind is that these judges are later referred to by God as believers, as their faith, which seems completely absent in the book of Judges, is evident in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, where we see several of the names repeated, Gideon and Jephthah and Samson, three names that we might be tempted to leave out, especially Gideon when it comes to faith. So we see that God uses these people, that God saves these people, which continues to give us encouragement that God is saving us despite our faults and that God is using us despite our faults. Well, make sure that you do the required reading. Make sure that you read any articles that have been assigned, including the ones that are found on Canvas. And I look forward to seeing you all in class.